profit as it used to be that Keith and I are running to, to um, build bits and pieces of cool uh, embedded stuff that's being used in the high-powered model rocketry hobby. But then, um, surprisingly enough, that now actually has a tighter connection with Arduino stuff than has been the case in the past. So it, it actually almost makes sense to be talking about that some here, and you'll see what I mean. Um, but then there's one other thing that I've been working on recently that I couldn't help throwing in a little bit. Those of you who um, came and heard my main conference talk last year about converting the big milling machine over to, to the CNC will recall that I said I was having some slight wigginesses with the little FPGA board I was using to drive the servos. And so this is the first prototype just recently put together of a board that <coughs> Uh, has a big FPGA and a bunch of connectors on it, not a lot else, but uh, this is completely open hardware design, open source implementation of a four channel high power servo control board for use with the MC2. And as soon as I get back from the conference and from FOSDEM and have a chance to catch my breath a little bit, <coughs> I'll finish debugging this and if it works out okay. Um, as you can tell, I went nuts. It's a four layer board. It's you know designed for maximum noise immunity and all that kind of stuff. And if it works out okay, I'll be offering those for sale through my website too. But enough about that. If you're curious about this, feel free to come talk to me about it later in the week. Okay, so Altus Metrum. Um, it's been a crazy year. Um, during the latter half of the year, uh, we reorganized Altus Metrum. Instead of just being a .org, it's now an LLC which in U.S. lingo means it's a limited liability company. I'm sort of in between a privately owned company and a, and a full corporation. <clears throat> um, and the reason for that was primarily to keep our accountants happy, but it's kind of weird now to have like a real company, Altus Metrum. Um, and Keith Packard and I remain the principals, and everything we do is still 100% open hardware and open source stuff, but um, we are just selling enough of it now that the accountants would like us to you know, be <coughs> a little more organized about the paperwork. Um, Telemetrum, which is the um, uh, rocket flight computer that we were using last year, uh, many of us in the uh, projects we built in the Rocketry Miniconf, uh, when we showed up here at LCA, the very first uh, version 1.1 boards were brought down here and flown by uh, some of the folks that were involved in that Miniconf. By the end of the year, that production run had sold out. So we now have a couple hundred um, board sets of Telemetrum flight computers out in the high power model rocketry a hobby community, and that's been really cool. Um, late in the 1.1 cycle, we started getting these um, occasional reports from customers that um, had bought the boards that they were seeing spontaneous resets during flight. And to make a long story short, we realized that we over-optimized the design and took out one more bypass cap than we really should have. And it is entirely possible to get enough RF noise into the input of the low dropout voltage regulator to cause it its output to droop just enough to trip the reset controller on those boards, at which point you get a non-harmful to anything except maybe the rocket, depending on where you are in flight, <coughs> um, a reset of the microprocessor. The good news is we're not aware of anybody that actually lost an airframe to this bug, but they certainly had situations where after putting out the parachutes, because by the way, when you're firing the pyro ejection charge is the time where this is most likely to happen. Um, we had a couple folks where you know the parachutes would come out and then the board would reset and they'd stop getting um, the same kind of telemetry they'd been getting and it was sort of confusing. Um, so we put out a big lengthy blog post about this problem and how we triaged it and offered to all of our existing customers with 1.1 boards that at no charge we'd be happy to update them. <coughs> and that's what I was offering earlier. I've got enough parts here to fix that. Um, if folks are interested in more details about that, feel free to ask me. Uh, version 1.2 is out and there's two things that are changed from 1.1. The first is um, the RF immunity fixes are all there. The second is that we were victims of the Japanese earthquake in a big way. It turns out that Freescale's MEMS uh, accelerometer line was in the Sendai facility and that building got pancaked. So. Um, they're, they're, right now, today, you cannot get Freescale's accelerometers. They're just gone. Um, all stock of anything. Well, except there's one, some guy in the Bay Area that is offering to sell you a few parts for a ridiculous price, but you know, there's always somebody like that on the market. Um, <clears throat> and so we had to change accelerometer vendors. Uh, we're using the analog devices, 70G part that works just great. Um, but that was an unexpected need to rev the board, which I wasn't counting on having to, to go through. And that, as a result, meant that for the second year in a row, we were all out of stock going into the Christmas buying season, which <coughs> was not great. 
But those are all out now. They work great um, and they're for sale if anybody wants one. I have a couple with me. Um, the Telemini is a new um, flight computer that we came out with this year. Um, the telemetry board's a lot of fun, but we were interested in doing something that was less expensive and could plausibly be used in even smaller rockets. Um, that's a photo of the board. And because it's hard to convey the sense of scale, um, this is one of them which I'll pass around. That's small enough it'll fit inside an SD standard 18 millimeter rocket airframe. And the compromise is that we give up all the sensors except the barrow pressure sensor. And that means the firmware had to get more intelligent because we're actually um, estimating velocity and acceleration during flight um, using just the barrow readings. Uh, so that um, this board will happily do flights past Mach without needing to have lockout settings and all that sort of stuff. Um, and that's all thanks to, to you know, the crazy amount of time that Keith puts into the firmware. Uh, the microcontroller in this, for those of you who don't recall, is an 8051 core with 32K of flash and 4K of RAM. And uh, at any given moment, we're within a few bytes of being out of flash. And <clears throat> every time we want to add a new feature, we have to go figure out how to get more clever about something that's already there. Um, but, I mean, I'm serious, but this is kind of the fun part of working with microcontroller stuff, right? Uh, there have been a couple times in the last year where Keith has sort of paused and asked me if he's thanked me enough times recently for designing toys just for him. And I think given what he does for a day job, the fact that he gets to work on things like this where he can, as one person, wrap his brain around the entire problem is part of the excitement. So anyway, tell him he's kind of cool. It's in the market. We're selling them. <coughs> Um, there are rocketry people who love them and others who just can't figure it out. You notice there's no switches, no jumpers. You talk to the thing over the radio all the time and that freaks some people out, but they're pretty cool. Um, however, because that board is so small, it didn't have enough physical space for me to put something like a USB connector on it. Um, we don't have any way on that board to charge the lithium polymer battery, so I was motivated to design a, a really cute, even smaller lithium polymer battery charging board. Um, I'm still hand loading all the ones of these that I make and, and sell, which is why I didn't bring huge piles of them with me. I was tempted to bring enough to just hand them out, but that's a dual rate charger. It'll do a 100 milliamp or 500 milliamp charge rate from a micro USB to the standard two pin, two millimeter JST connectors that are all on, on all of the lithium polymer batteries we use. And I think it's really cool. The coolest feature is the charging chip that I chose actually gives us enough state output that I've got a dual, uh, tiny little dual LED mounted on there. And what's driven me crazy in the past with a lot of battery chargers is, you know, you get one LED that tells you if it's charging or not, but if the light's not on, what does that really mean? Does it mean the battery's fully charged? Does it mean you tripped over the cord and it's not actually charging at all? <coughs> and so um, this gives you a positive indication of charge completion. Um, and if both LEDs are on, which actually looks kind of yellow um, because the red and green being close together kind of looks yellow, uh, that's your warning that, you know, something is wrong somewhere. And um, not a big deal, but just the kind of stuff we've done this year, sort of half for fun and half because it, we needed it to fill a gap in what else we were doing. Um, so then what I really wanted to talk about today are companion boards. And the idea with a companion board is that when we designed the telemetrum altimeter <coughs> for the rockets, we put a connector on it that was intended for adding expansion boards. We call those companion boards. And um, I'll talk a little bit about what's on that interface in just a sec. But from the very beginning, I've had this notion that I'd like to have a lot more pyro channels for doing complex flights, either uh, having rockets that you know, ignited additional motors after launch or had more complex um, deployment schemes or whatever. And so this board called Telepyro is one that I've had in my head for a long time and only recently actually got around to making. This is it, you can pass one of these around to you. That's a Telepyro board. Now one of the things that's kind of interesting, you'll notice the processor choice on this. Those of you who've actually looked at the little board that was in your um, attendees packet this year will notice that um, it's the same processor chip. <coughs> and I was highly amused when I discovered that because now all of you have development hardware for building companion boards. And uh, <coughs> the flip side of that is that if you want to try out Altos, which is Keith's little um, cooperative multitasking environment with thread support and all this stuff that we actually use as the basis for all of our flight code and companion board code. There is a port of that for the ATmega32U4 that's in our source tree. 
Uh, it's all GPL v2. Feel free to grab a copy, take a look. Um, there's even an internal stock now explaining sort of how Altos works and where to find the bits and pieces of it um, that you're welcome to take a look at and do whatever you'd like. Um, the other interesting thing that happened is about a year and a half ago, <coughs> my son and I were at a big rocket launch. And a good friend of ours, uh, Adrian Adamson, was on the flight line right next to us. He's kind of a, a crazy altitude nut, and he does all these custom, absolutely minimum size rockets to fly sort of monstrously huge motors in. And he had a very small custom carbon fiber airframe that he flew on a 38 millimeter diameter J-class motor to something like 23,000 feet. It's the most amazing thing I've ever seen. And when that rocket came back, um, it had gotten hot enough, because I think, if I remember correctly, that kissed Mach 3. Um, the, the carbon fiber that he built it out of, the epoxy had gotten hot enough that it had bubbled some, and the carbon fiber fabric was starting to de delaminate. My son took one look at it, stared at it, and turned to me and said, hey, Dad, this is because it got really hot, right? And I said, yes. And he thought about it a little bit longer, and he said, could we build a rocket to see how hot that gets? <coughs> It's like, well, gee, when you have a 12-year-old ask you questions like that, what do you do? You design a companion board. <coughs> um, and this one has the ability to support up to 12 uh, NTC thermistors. There's a particular EPCOS thermistor I discovered that's a uh, glass bead eight-tenths of a millimeter in diameter. So they have very little thermal inertia, and you can mount them right out sort of in the edges of fins and up the sides of nose cones and stuff like that. Um, and we built several of these boards as prototypes, and we flew a couple of them at the uh, Large Dangerous Rocket Ships launch this year. Uh, unfortunately, we had a mechanical failure of the coupler behind the nose cone at Mach 0.97 when we hit a little bit of crosswind and uh, <laughs> burned the rest of the propellant going sideways. <coughs> um, so not as much cool data to report as I'd like, but um, this is an example of another board we've done. I think I would uh, eventually, there's been a lot of interest in this from school groups and so forth, so I think eventually that one may you know, get added to the product list. The problem, of course, is I designed it with the uh, thermistor amplifiers very carefully designed and tuned for that one model of EPCOS thermistor, and I don't know that that's what everybody would want to use, so got to kind of figure out what to do with that. But um, those are the two examples of specific companion boards so far that I've designed. For those of you who haven't seen them coming around yet, that's a telepyro board. And, uh, it really is fairly simple. Micro USB on all of these for uh, programming and talking to the uh, AT Mega 32U4. There are four dual FETs down here. This one happens to have a three axis magnetic sensor on it, but not so great for rockets. Don't think we'll fly that again. Um, and uh, I did put the six pin RG, uh, AVR programming header on there as well because uh, at the time we were building these, we hadn't quite sussed out the flashing over USB thing, and that requires a bootloader, and well, anyway, you understand. Um, so that's Telepyro, and then this is Telescience. Um, very similar electrically, though mechanically quite different. Um, in this case, it's got the 12 um, analog input buffering channels, um, which have op-amp thermistor conditioning circuits on them as well. Um, and yes, I, all of these prototypes are ones that I continue to load by hand at home. All the passives are 0402 size surface mount. Let me tell you, I hate resistors. <coughs> um, you have to get them right side up, you can't put the black side down, and there are 116 or something resistors on this board. I load them in batches of three, and I'm usually about ready to kill myself or somebody else by the time I'm done. So <coughs> when you see those, yeah, dear daughter here knows. Um, What's that? Yeah, 0402s. And then, well, so I mean, the funny story is when I first started working with the TI Chipcon RF system on chip that we use for a lot of stuff, um, they made it very clear that if you wanted to get the best performance out of the RF filter section, you had to do it in a 402 or smaller because otherwise the geometry of the traces gets to be too big. Well, anyway, if you want good RF performance, that's what you do. And now on about the fifth rev of the circuit boards, I'm actually getting better RF output on all of my boards than TI's reference designs, which is really cool. So we've got that dialed in and working really well. But um, the consequence of that is I kind of got in the habit of using 0402. And so <coughs> that CNC FPGA board is the first thing I've ever designed using surface mount parts bigger than 0402 since my original uh, altimeter board talked about at Melbourne LCA, I guess it was, <coughs> um, which used 1206s. So 
Yeah, um, there's way too much 0402 in my life. And I would do smaller if I could see them. Um, okay, so not, you know, not, companion words are cool, but um, we've wanted for a long time to do something a little better. You know, right now our principal ground station looks like this. This one has a shorter cable than most of the ones I sell, but there's a tiny little board in here that has one of the RF system on chips on it. We use it as a, a radio to USB interface. Um, we've done a version now called TeleBT, which is the same thing, but we added a pre-manufactured Bluetooth module that I found a source for in China that's reasonably cost-effective. Um, and because I want to be able to use this wirelessly, it has to have a battery and the battery charger and all that stuff on it. So this is basically, we call this TeleBT, it's basically a teledongle with Bluetooth, and we use it, it would be used as a Bluetooth to our kind of UHF radio interface. The idea is you'd mount this at the feed point of a little handheld Yagi antenna that you could point at the rocket and then stand there with your Android phone and the app, which is almost working right, um, and use that for tracking the rocket in flight. And of course it can also be used with the Bluetooth that's on a laptop or something. It implements the serial, the SPP, Bluetooth profile, which is the serial port protocol, which means that it'll work for anything except Apple products just fine. Mac OS is okay, but any um, iPhone or iPad things need not apply because Apple is actively hostile to anyone who wants to develop hardware accessories for those devices. I'll be happy to go into more details later if you'd like. The short version is in the same way that I can't do license-free RF in the U.S. without going nuts. I can't do anything that works with iPhones or iPads without going nuts. And this is supposed to be fun, not nuts, so just not going to do it. Um, <coughs> Um, and then Teleterra, um, we had a couple of years ago done, if you go out to our website and look under Teleterra, you'll see photos of the original sort of completely standalone ground station we did. Unfortunately, when we priced it out, we figured out we'd have to sell it for over 400 bucks. <coughs> and you know, I just couldn't imagine anyone, except maybe me, thinking that was cool enough to buy. And so we backed off and we kind of forgot about it for a while. Well, we unforgot about it when some very good friends in various rocketry clubs in the U.S. started pestering us about, can't you give us something so we don't have to lug a notebook up and down the flight line? And we didn't really understand what a big deal that was until we actually had a chance to visit some of these launch sites and we realized that they're always breezy and they're in the middle of plowed fields and there's dust everywhere and notebooks just don't do real well in the windy dust. So. I went back and took a look, and by radically simplifying some aspects of the design, giving up on voice synthesis in the handheld unit and things like that, um, we've got it down to where I think this version we could actually afford to produce and sell. Um, one of the ways I save money, though, is I got rid of our expensive, relatively, GPS antenna with its amplified patch and am trying a, a really small chip GPS antenna. And the tuning on that's a little finicky, and I haven't quite got it right yet, but. I'll pass that around as well. So, <clears throat> again, for us, these are rocketry things, but, you know, this is a TICC 11, 11 platform that has GPS and radio link and an LCD and a bunch of buttons. In Australia, you are blessed with a sane, I think, RF regulatory um, process where um, these can be operated without a license under the low probability of interference device regulations uh, in the frequency band of interest. So unlike in the US, you don't have to have a ham radio license in Australia to use this stuff. Though I, of course, encourage everybody to get ham radio licenses because I think it's a brilliant thing to do and a lot of fun. Um, but you know, um, part of the reason I'm showing this here is these are all open hardware designs, all the schematics, PC board artwork, all the source code for everything is all up on our uh, Git repo behind altusmetrum.org. Feel free to go have a look and borrow from it or use things or tell us if you'd like to buy stuff and we'll figure that out too. Um, for those of you who haven't seen them come around, this is what a TeleBT looks like. Um, and so, again, I don't know, if you want details, I'll be happy to talk about these more. Uh, these are all sort of small and part of the re and, and strangely shaped, and it has to do with the fact that we've there are these translucent blue plastic boxes from Hammond that we are sort of our signature thing these days, and so all Altus Metrum products that need a box are being designed to fit into one or another of Hammond's cute little blue boxes. Uh, I don't actually have a photo of the new version of Teleterra that's coming out, so you'll have to look at that in person. Okay. 
So what I originally proposed to John that <coughs> might be fun to talk about today was um, the fact that we've talked forever about the fact that we ought to do something like a white paper explaining how to use Arduino things as companion boards for Telemetrum. Now, that obviously only really matters to people who own some of our Telemetrum rocketry goodness, but it seems still like it would be a good thing to do, particularly because there are some school groups that have been very interested in designing their own companion boards. And you get into these lengthy discussions with them and you realize that they don't really want to like lay out circuit boards. They want to hack stuff together in the same way that people do a lot with proto shields on Arduino. And for the size projects a lot of these folks are working on, why not? Makes sense. <coughs> so it turns out that on Telemetrum, the companion port is a little eight pin connector that happens to have SPI, a uh, serial peripheral interface bus, um, with one uh, chip select line at 3.3 volt levels. And it provides both the regulated and unregulated power from the telemetrum board that could be used by the companion. As of version 1.0 of Altos, we radically changed the over the radio telemetry protocol to use the fixed packet size, one byte of which is used to determine which packet type this is. And a consequence of that is that we were also able to add, finally, support for companion boards that during the power up process, there's a little protocol that runs over the SPI bus where we interrogate the companion board, find out not only what it is, but how many telemetry channels it would like to offer up and how often it would like to have those sent in the RF downlink. And then those just automatically get folded into the telemetry that's being sent down over the radio. <coughs> so you can design an arbitrary companion board, tell us that you've got eight telemetry channels you'd like reported once every five seconds, and that just happens. Um, as of this morning, uh, Keith has finished documenting that protocol in supposedly human readable text, though I haven't read it yet. Um, and as soon as I'm done talking, I'll go back and push the updated copy of the docs out to the repo so that you can find them. Don't look for them right now because they aren't there yet. Um, but with that, anybody who would like to do that, I think now has all the information they need to do it. Um, and again, if you have any questions, feel free to ask about them. So what's this thing called Teleshield about? Well, you, how many of you were at the Arduino Miniconf last year when I gave a little talk about the greenhouse project we were working on? Yeah, great. Um, my wife has a greenhouse behind our house in Colorado. <coughs> and. Um, you know, it's got a vent fan because in the middle of summer in Colorado at high altitude, the sun is just every bit as harsh, if not worse, than it is in this part of the world. And it gets really hot in there and you have to run a, a fan to keep things from, from wilting and burning up and dying. And uh, at the edges of the seasons, it gets really cold. <coughs> and so there are heaters that run to do um, the opposite. Um, and my son got interested in hydroponic things and was talking about wanting to be able to program time, you know, have program timers to turn pumps on and off and all that. So um, being the kind of dad I am, I turned that into an Arduino Shield project. <coughs> and uh, that's been sort of his project. And so it's you know, stumbled along fairly slowly. Uh, we did get to the point where the basic project is complete and seems to do all the things it's supposed to. The relay control stuff's all working and so forth. One of our objectives all along, though, is that um, mom would love to be able to do things like find out what temperature it is out in the greenhouse without having to walk out there. <coughs> and so from the beginning, we talked about using one of the circuit boards from a teledongle um, to, to hook things up. But um, well, yeah, right. So this was the original plan, a little spark fun level shifter board to take the 3.3 volts out of the teledongle. This is the guts of a teledongle. And that connector at the top is the companion connector. And the idea was to interface that to um, serial or SPI ports, whichever. Oh, by the way, and on the companion port, while I talk about it as being SPI because that's the protocol that we use on Telemetrum for talking to companions, those same pins can be used as async serials. So if you're willing to change the firmware on the CC1111, you could also do async over that port. So the plan was going to be to do either async or SPI to the Arduino. But then it's like, well, yeah, but that's kind of a mess. Um, so I ended up designing a shield. <coughs> and um, as I said, I kind of went nuts. Um, I used one of the TI TXS Magic level shifting chips, which means that I don't actually care what the voltage level on the attached Arduino is. It just works. Um, it's got one of our style UHF radios implemented using the CC1111 RF system on chip that we use on everything else. Attached to that is a micro USB interface and our standard debug and companion headers. So once again, this shield board 
uh, jumper the right way can be used, uh, powered off of USB just like a teledongle or a, a tele Bluetooth thing. But then we also uh, put the Bluetooth interface on it that we had discovered and are using on our tele Bluetooth product. And then um, just because Keith said he needed it for something he was working on, uh, we stuck a micro SD socket on so that uh, you've got some data storage. And that is literally the first prototype um, which I got working about a week ago. And because um, I'm all over making a fool of myself in public, I'm going to turn this on. So what I have right now is uh, I borrowed a lithium polymer battery from Grant because I forgot to bring any with me. This is one of the SparkFun 3.3 volt Arduino Pro 328s or something with the shield uh, stuck on top of it and jumpered to just take its power off it there. And then if I, what do I have to do? If I do that and then open this up and drag it over. Right, okay, so now I'm talking over the serial port and I'm talking to my teledongle, serial number 100. That's this cute little puppy here. If I then put it into our packet protocol, it should connect, yep, to the other guy. And now I'm talking to that board, and the hello and goodbye world are actually being generated by a sketch running on the Arduino. And so right now I'm just echoing the Arduino serial port through the RF link. And uh, lest you believe I'm cheating or something, I will turn this off. And sure enough, it got stopped spewing. And when I turn it back on, it's going to reinitialize. And I have to send a keystroke or something at it to wake it up again. Right? Which board am I talking to? I'm talking to Shield again, and there we go. And then the Bluetooth stuff is almost as much fun. Um, if I, unfortunately, I don't know how to bring this up on the remote display, so bear with me for a second. I'm going to connect to the serial port profile, which brought up dev rfcom0. And now if I pop and open another terminal window and drag it over here. Oh, give me a break. Why is it that half the time when you bring up devrfcom0 it does this and the other half the time it doesn't? Let's try a disconnect on that and reconnect and see if that clears it. I'm, you know, I guess I should be amazed that this stuff works as well as it does, but there we go. Okay. So now there we are um, talking over Bluetooth. And the really amusing part is that um, the firmware running in the little shield board right now responds to whoever last had its attention. So if we come over to the UHF link, it's redirecting there. <laughs> And, um, yeah, thanks. <laughs> stupid people tricks, right? So, talk about stupid people. About the time I got to this point, I went, oh, great, so the demo I ought to do is we ought to upload a new sketch to the Arduino while I'm standing there. And then I realized that I did the wrong thing with the reset lines and I need to cut one resistor out and put a FET in so that we can actually pull the Arduino's reset line from our processor. So. We may or may not get around to that this week. I'll certainly make that change before I put these into production, if we do in fact put them in production. Um, but I just, I don't know, somehow the notion of being able to reprogram the Arduino over either Bluetooth or a theoretical 30 mile range UHF link, um, I don't know, it just seems cool to me. So that's Teleshield. Um, and uh, by the way, um, a few minutes, 15 maybe being generous. Before we left for the airport to come down here, I took another three prototype teleshields out of the skillet uh, after hand loading and reflowing them. And uh, this morning I cleaned them up and uh, started adding the through hole parts to them. If we get those turned on, if any of you would like to play with one while you're here this week, uh, feel free to poke me and I'll be happy to let you do that. And uh, if you talk to me sweetly enough and <coughs> cash is involved, you can probably even take one home. So. Um, yeah, you know, I'm, I'm, what, what can I say? So let me see, what else did I have in here? That, that's it, except the obligatory. If you have any other questions or would like to see any of the other things we're doing, uh, please feel free to take a look. I guess as long as I'm passing things around, that's a telemetrum. I don't know that everybody's seen one. Yeah. 
Yeah, where are they all? Have they made it around the room? Did they get stopped somewhere? I will get them all back before I leave. <laughs> so yeah, if you'd like to look at the shield, I'll even pass that around. In fact, I'll pass it around running. Yep, I think we're about out of time. If you have other questions, I'll be around. Feel, please feel free to come up and say hi and ask about them, and I'll be happy to tell you anything you'd like to know. Thanks. Yeah. Yep. Okay, we have an afternoon tea break now. So it's about, I think we've got about 25 minutes left of the break. And then starting back here around 3.40 for the next talk. Slide the switch on the side when we just turn that off. Yeah, I think they all sort of just ended up there. Oh, man. Oh, yeah, grab that.
Uh, okay, uh, my name is David Zanetti. I'm going to be talking about uh, the internals of Atmel's AVR XMega architecture, which I know is quite a mouthful, but bear with me. Um, with the addition of the IO ref pin to the standard Arduino shield format, it opens up the possibility of having shields which can adapt automatically to whatever the voltage is that your uh, base Arduino is actually running at. Um, so for example, this, this means that uh, with a couple of level shifters on your shield, you can now easily deal with a, an Arduino that's based on 3.3 volts or 1.8. Now the other thing this does is open up the possibility of having Arduinos that are not based uh, purely on the original mega architecture which is mostly limited to 5 volt. Most of the Arduinos out there that are 5 volt. Um, instead it allows you to use microcontrollers that are, uh, have different voltages and, and different operating capabilities. So one of the uh, possible microcontrollers you could use is an extension of the mega platform that uh, is already at the core of all of the Arduinos. Uh, the XMega is, is essentially a souped up mega. It uses exactly the same tool chain uh, as the mega that you're already used to in uh, all of the Arduino stuff. It's buried under the Arduino IDE a little bit, but it is all there. Um, and uh, this means that if you're looking for a platform that's, that's got a bit more capability but you don't want to stray too far away from uh, the tools that you're already used to, then the XMEG is kind of useful in that regard. This is also true if you start getting into some of the external programmers uh, and uh, debug tools. Um, if you're familiar with the AVR Dragon, uh, which is a JTAG and does occasional bits of serial uh, for debugging, or the ISP Mark II uh, and the JTAG ICE, um, those are all also capable of dealing with XMegas, and more importantly, it uses the same um, software tool chain on, on the Linux side of things to interface with those uh, programmers. So you're not, you're not really changing a lot in terms of the environment that you're dealing with on your uh, development, um, you're mostly just changing the chip environment. And I guess the other good thing about the XMega is that they're quite a lot faster. Um, they're between three and four times faster at the same voltage level compared to a mega. Uh, since this is the same CPU core, it ends up being three to four times faster than, than uh, a mega in real terms, so it's, it's fairly comparable. There are a, a few reasons why you possibly wouldn't want to choose an XMega. Um, all of the very low level code um, in any of your projects, um, this is down sort of at the level where the libraries where, uh, that the Arduino IDE provides, all of those unfortunately will need to be rewritten. Uh, they have uh, comprehensively redesigned a lot of the way the peripherals work. The rest of this talk is going to be all about peripherals, really. Um, so, unfortunately, all of your low, low level code is going to have to be rewritten. But the high level stuff, if the Arduino IDE supports uh, an XMega chip, you'll still be able to write uh, digital write and it will just work. Um, so, it, it's really just the, the libraries themselves lower down that need to be rewritten. Uh, the other problem is this is a 3.3 volt part. They do not make a 5 volt version of it at all. Um, it. <laughs> It, um, it will accept 5 volt in its I.O. pins and not release Magic Smoke, which is really good. Uh, but uh, that 5 volt tolerant I.O. thing just means that it won't explode. That's it. It doesn't mean that it'll actually work. Uh, so yeah, that's a bit of a concern. Uh, it's a surface mount only part. They are not producing any PDIP versions. You can only get this in surface mount packages. Uh, I know surface mounts are a bit scary to, to some people who have just sort of started soldering, but um, there are some techniques you can use to make it easier, so don't be too afraid of the surface mount parts. Uh, they are not as hard to use as it seems. Uh, debugging for them uh, is not in a, a terribly great state with free software. Avarice only in the last month received a patch that would actually uh, debug a, um, a chip that only has uh, the uh, serial programming protocol on it. Um, so it's, it's a bit of a Needs a bit of work, um, but it is slowly getting there. And uh, probably the thing that's given me the most grief when I started XMega development was the fact they've included 
a crypto module in the MCU, which is great. Yeah, you can do hardware accelerated crypto, except the United States considers crypto to be a munition, and therefore you need to go through an enormous amount of paperwork in order to get any of these chips. Um, thankfully, there are some families that don't have a crypto module, and they're really easy to get. So if you stick to those, it's, it's, uh, life is much easier. So I've kind of mentioned uh, this PDI thing in some of the slides, so I'm going to expand a bit on it. Um, PDI replaces the uh, ISP protocol for doing serial programming of megas. Uh, they've come up with a completely new serial protocol that incorporates the debug functions as well into the, uh, into the same protocol. Uh, the other thing is that it's not overloaded on the SPI port. On a mega, the SPI port doubles for whatever peripherals you've got attached to it, as well as is being used for the um, uh, ISP interface. On an X mega, instead, it's it's got a dedicated pin for its data, and uh, the clock is just overloaded on reset. So you don't have to worry quite so much about whether your peripherals are going to be interacting badly with your external uh, programming interface, which is quite good. Um, this does mean that you need to be a little bit careful about your design. You can no longer apply the, the usual rule for megas of just having a pull up on the reset line to make them go. Um, since the X mega has an internal pull up on its reset line, uh, you don't actually need to worry about the pull up at all. But more importantly, because the clock is being sent over the reset line, uh, you've got to be very careful about making sure there's no stray capacitance or uh, any kind of latency introduced into that line compared to the, the data line. So there's a few design considerations you're just going to be aware of. Uh, clocking. Probably one of the things that frustrates me the most about the Mega is the fact that if you want to run it at its full clock speed, you have to have an external crystal. And in order to make it use an external crystal, you have to set fuses. And the fuse system with Megas is, is not particularly pretty. Um, it's very easy if you write the wrong fuses to end up locking yourself out of the chip because there are a bunch of lock bits for application protection and there are a bunch of bits to actually disable the programming interfaces as well. Uh, thankfully, you don't have to do that on an X Mega anymore. Uh, the full clock speed of the chip uh, is available by simply adding uh, a few lines of code in your, uh, at the beginning of your application and away you go. Um, the other thing that's quite nice is that uh, if you want to run a mega at full speed, you definitely have to have an external crystal. You can't get away with relying on any kind of internal oscillator. They're limited, unfortunately, to 8 megahertz, whereas on an X mega, you can actually run them at full clock speed entirely without any external components, which is really, really quite nice. Um, since these are becoming quite fast chips, they've got a PLL. Um, what that does is allow you to take a uh, an external lower speed crystal and multiply it up to a high speed one. So if you've only got an 8 megahertz crystal around, it's no trouble. You can still run it at full speed by using the PLL to multiply it up by four times. Um, this is useful also because some of the hardware actually runs at um, two or four times the system clock, so it's quite a lot faster as well. Um, another useful feature is it's got external uh, clock failure detection, if uh, the crystal isn't there uh, on a mega, what happens is your chip doesn't work and you have to find a rescue clock. Uh, on a, an X mega, it goes, oh, this is not very good, and switches back to the 2 megahertz internal oscillator and gives you an interrupt to say, you know what, things didn't really work out, but here, have, have some chance to recover it. So it's kind of good, and you can do dynamic clocking, but that's not very exciting. Uh, the largest change of all uh, to the hardware design and the reason why you need to redesign, uh, rewrite all of your driver code is that every single peripheral is now represented by a struct. Um, rather than having a collection of randomly named registers that sort of have a pattern to them, um, instead you just have a, a struct that represents every possible instance of that particular piece of hardware. So if you've got four serial ports you will just have four instances of this struct. Now what's useful about that is that it makes it considerably easier to abstract the hardware resources that you've got on the chip away from the way your code's written. It's something that the Arduino IDE does quite a lot of. Um, so when I started porting 
uh, my interrupt driven serial code, it became kind of clearer that um, I could abstract it a little bit further into my own struct that contained right at the top there uh, a pointer to the, the real hardware and then the resources that I wanted to associate with it. Now, this abstraction, as I say, occurs all throughout the IDE code. In fact, a lot of the IDE libraries are spent hiding all of the, the details between different microcontrollers. Um, and this is actually a much cleaner way of doing exactly the same thing. So uh, it, it's kind of useful. Um, to, to take advantage of that, you just need to um, assign uh, the hardware reference up there as USART F0 uh, into whatever particular abstraction layer you want. And then when it comes to writing your interrupts, um, you can simply pass a reference to your abstracted serial port and it has full access to the hardware. So in this case, we're doing a um, data register empty uh, interrupt, which is works the same way as it does on Omega. It fires constantly so long as you don't have anything in a serial transmit buffer. Um, on Omega, you'd have to write a chunk of code that was specific for that very serial port. And on an Xmega, you can just say, oh, look, there's some generic handler. Please just handle it. And then it still has direct access to the hardware. So those abstraction features are particularly useful. Um, it, it becomes very apparent the moment that you want to port code between different XMEGA members that you're really just changing very small numbers of lines of code because the rest of it is just references to structs, which is, again, quite nice. So uh, everyone likes blinky LEDs. Um, the ports on the XMEGA haven't really changed a huge amount. Um, one of the things that's a bit weird about a mega is that if you've got an input pin and you want to have a pull up on it, you stick one in its output register even though it's an input, uh, which is a bit weird. Um, instead on the X mega they've cleaned it all up and now there are explicit pull up modes for each pin and it's a bit easier to read because it says pull up which is a lot nicer. Um, there are also a few new modes for pins, including explicit pull-downs, there's a weak bus keeper, and there's also various wide, or, and and modes, which are all kind of neat and fun. Uh, and lastly, because um, a lot of the time you're going to be, uh, particularly if you're implementing blinky LEDs or you're implementing any kind of bit-banging protocol, uh, quite often you're just going to be toggling individual pins. And so the, the port struct includes these bitwise registers for out and for direction, um, which makes it a lot easier to uh, set bunches of pins in particular ways and to toggle pins. It's, it's all uh, reduced down to a single write uh, to a register instead of a read modify write, which again improves in performance. And I think it does make the code a little bit easier to read. So. Uh, and there's an example of doing that. Uh, port interrupts. Um, there used to be, well, on the Megas, there's a, a direct hardware interrupt. Usually, if you're using a Mega for anything interesting, you lose almost all of those direct interrupts for other peripherals. But there's usually at least one that's free. Um, those direct interrupts have all gone away, and instead, what was called a pin change interrupt on the Mega is now just simply referred to as a port interrupt. Now the pin change interrupts on a Mega are annoying. They, they simply fire an interrupt any time a pin changes state. They don't tell you how it changed state. They just go, oh, it changed state and you can work this out for yourself. Uh, that's a bit of a pain. Um, thankfully, the, the port interrupts, while they are grouped like they are on a Mega, each pin has its own sense mode, so you can uh, more clearly get uh, an interrupt only on rising edges, only on falling edges, so on and so forth, uh, which is quite a bit nicer. And uh, to, get, uh, to overcome the fact that you've only got, um, uh, you've no longer got the hardware direct interrupts anymore, you get two interrupts per port and you can allocate them as you see fit. So uh, you can actually get pretty close to the equivalent of a direct interrupt. It's not actually that bad, um, but uh, at least the pin change interrupts have been made a lot better because I hated them. Um, since we're talking about interrupts, interrupts on the entire microcontroller have changed. Um, the interrupt subsystem is now capable of nesting interrupts 
which means that um, if you're in the middle of an interrupt piece of interrupt code and you have a higher priority interrupt come along, it will service the higher priority interrupt and then go back to your low level code, uh, your low, low interrupt code. Um, this applies to all interrupts and every single interrupt can be given uh, a level completely under your control so it's no longer a situation where exactly which order interrupts fire and is a little bit uh, unclear. The, instead you can clearly say I want this pin change interrupt to be really high priority and I don't care if you're servicing USART data at the time or whatever else that is that you're doing. Uh, this does mean that there's one extra step for enabling interrupts, well two I guess. One is that instead of just enabling an interrupt you actually now set a level for it and uh, when enabling interrupts globally you need to remember to enable the level of interrupts as well, which is a little interesting quirk. Right, uh, timers. The timers in, in the Mega are, are useful for all sorts of things. Uh, I, I guess a lot of code actually boils down to setting up timers and then waiting for things. Um, the timers in the, the X Mega have been significantly overhauled. One of the things that's uh, quite good is that they're all 16 bit now. An 8 bit timer at 32 megahertz is not really a lot of time, so they weren't sort of seen to be terribly useful. Uh, so they're all 16-bit, which is nice. Um, one of the things that's kind of annoying about a mega is that if you want a time at a count from naught to some number that isn't the maximum possible number the timer can have, you lose all of your output compares and your input captures. This means that you can't do PWM to just an arbitrary number. You, you have to do it uh, either the full scale of the timer or not at all. Um, that mode was called CTC on uh, the AVR mega timers. Uh, now all timers have a period register so you no longer lose the ability to do PWM with, uh, with any of your timers, even if you want to have a top value that isn't uh, the maximum the timer can have, which is quite nice. Uh, there's a bunch of other minor changes to timers. Uh, the, probably the more interesting one is that one of the timers on the Mega uh, was called an async timer. It was usually timer zero. Someone can correct me on that. Um, the, this was primarily used to have a watch crystal attached to it so you could run an RTC. Uh, it's quite useful to have one of those. Um, but the, because of uh, the intent of turning everything into structs, it wasn't really convenient, it seems, to have a, an async timer that was going to be fed from a watch crystal. So no timer can be fed from a watch crystal at all. You can only get them fed from the system clock and one other source. Uh, now I did say that uh, they took away the async timers, and it's sort of partially true. Uh, what they replaced it with is a limited timer called an RTC that performs all of the functions the async timer used to have. But it's significantly cut down, you can't do PWM with it. Um, all you can do is kind of give it a period and, and maybe give it a compare and otherwise it's, it's just going to sit there generating interrupts. So while it, it doesn't seem like a hugely useful module, uh, it's actually quite good as a, as a little system clock um, and it frees you up from having to dedicate timers that you could use for blinking LEDs. Um, you can instead just use the RTC for, for that. So that's quite kind of handy. One of the things that's completely new on the Mega that has uh, on the X Mega um, is this event system. Um, there's nothing really in a, a Mega microcontroller that's the same as it, other than just firing interrupts constantly. Um, what it allows you to do is route things that would normally be considered to be interrupts between peripherals without involving the CPU. Uh, this allows you to do things like coordinate uh, multiple peripherals to do things at the same time. So let's say for example you've got uh, a couple of timers that, uh, that are busily counting up and you want them to perform a capture at the same moment. Um, it's a little bit difficult to set that up on a mega. You can 
get fairly close, but, but there will be some latency between getting the capture happening on both timers. With the event system, instead you can ensure that both modules receive the event at the same clock cycle and therefore their actions are completely synchronized. Um, this can also be used to uh, uh, chain together timers so that you can form a single 32-bit timer if you want um, and there's a bunch of other unique stuff you can do with it that really wasn't possible on the Mega. Uh, the main I guess one of the main benefits is the, the whole single clock latency. It takes quite a long time to service an interrupt. You lose at least five clock cycles just to get to the prologue and then you lose a whole lot in the prologue. Um, so this is for a lot of systems where you would traditionally fire large numbers of interrupts. Um, this allows you to get rid of all of that interrupt workload and instead just funnel it into, uh, into the event system. So it's a uh, it is quite a useful feature and I've used it for a few things that are kind of odd. Uh, wow, um, there's a whole lot of other peripherals that I haven't really had the time to, to go into great detail right now about. Um, there is a, now a DMA peripheral that allows you to share, uh, allows you to copy data between peripherals and allows you to copy data uh, between RAM, uh, between sections of RAM. Uh, it's interesting because it can be triggered off the event system, which means that you can get an ADC to perform a conversion, and then when that conversion is finished, you can get the DMA engine to copy it straight away into your, the variable that you would, be you would actually be reading it from. Um, so you can use this to, to create a few shortcuts in dealing with a few peripherals. Uh, it's, it's capable of um, doing things like uh, setting up a bunch of characters you might want to send out to a serial port and you can buffer those and tell the DMA engine to actually deal with those characters as it comes through. That's kind of useful. Uh, there's a crypto module, I don't want to talk about the crypto module because it annoys me. Uh, the timers I said couldn't be async. Um, it turns out that you can clock them from the event system. This allows you to do a few odd things that weren't obvious to me when I first looked at the data sheet. One of them is that it allows you to uh, count events with a timer rather than just measuring amounts of time. Um, and because you can use the event system to pick up those events from pretty much anything, including software generated events, um, it's handy for, for solving a bunch of um, problems involving timing. I ended up using the, that particular feature to um, connect it up to a, an external RTC to give me a more reliable external clock than I would normally have. Uh, so it's kind of useful. Uh, there is a whole lot of stuff involving allowing you to aggregate uh, groups of pins from different ports into a big virtual port. So if you've got pins scattered all over the microcontroller, you can group those together into virtual ports and deal with them as one thing. Uh, there are versions that actually have full USB endpoints, um, although I think the support for that's pretty variable at the moment. Not many people have written much code for it at the moment at all. And lastly, it has a DAC for making sound, and I'm sure everyone's really keen to hear more sounds out of microcontrollers. So. Anyway, that's uh, me. Any questions? Um, yeah, one question. Yep. Uh, example boards that use um, those MCUs that people could have a look at with that request. Uh, the question was example boards that have got that microcontroller. Um, Atmel themselves have a reference board they call the Explained A1, I think. Um, that has uh, an XMega A1 on it and a bunch of random peripherals including a piezoelectric speaker for sound stuff. Um, that's probably the quickest way to get a reference board but um, sadly no one has really been terribly interested in making an Arduino clone yet with one. I'm hoping that people will start to think about making Arduino clones with XMegas. So yeah. Any other questions?
obviously more we're talking about the different type of CPU or whatever. So, so where, where do you see this fitting, I guess? Uh, the question was, where does this fit into the grand scheme of microcontrollers? Um, the, the obvious leap above this one is ARM, um, but that's an entirely different environment. And uh, in that environment, you're, you're kind of no longer dealing with microcontrollers in some way, you're dealing with, with real CPUs. I think where this fits in is for people who want the kind of power that you could use an ARM CPU for, but are more comfortable writing microcontroller style code. Um, so it, it, fits, it fits within that kind of gap between very low speed microcontrollers and the much higher speed ARM stuff um, where, for example, the uh, Arduino Duo, I think it's called, is going to be going. Um, so it fits between those kind of two ranges. Um, yeah. That's all we've got time for. So cool. thanks, Thank you. Great, thank you. Most welcome.